Hello and welcome to the Orthodox Christian Mission Presents. I'm Judith Irene Mata, your host and the producer of the program. Today we're going to delve in to the historical writings of those who came after the Apostles. The New Testament epistles are kind of an introduction into those who followed directly after St. John the Apostle. The Lord allowed St. John, the beloved disciple, to live a long time. He was headquartered as bishop in Ephesus. As many of you, especially pastors and teachers, don't really have time to order and to delve into the historical sources. I'm going to make it easy for you today. I'm going to read some from the epistles and the writings of those who came the first century after St. Paul. One of these first disciples in the generation following John the Apostle is Irenaeus of Lyon. Important it is to stay to the commentaries and traditions of the Apostles. Now many say, they're not readily available. Oh my friends, yes they are. We have many commentaries from the early fathers. I'll read some of St. Irenaeus's commentaries and you'll see he weaves the Old with the New Testament with the prophecies. You will be astonished at what some of the things are. The interpretations from the Apostle John and from the rest of the Apostles given to them by none other than Christ himself. Are we to question Christ? Do you think they misremembered? This is the person who rose from the dead and who before many of their eyes preached to them after his resurrection. This book is literally so packed with doctrine and teaching about the Old Testament and New, especially about the Incarnation of Christ. Many false prophets are gone out into the world as St. John has written. Hereby you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Every spirit which separates Jesus Christ, in other words, denies His true Incarnation is not from God, but is from Antichrist. These words agree with what was said in the Gospel, the first chapter of John. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Wherefore he again exclaims in his epistle, Everyone that believeth that Jesus is Christ has been born of God. Knowing Jesus Christ to be one and the same, to whom the gates of heaven were opened because of his taking upon him flesh, who shall also come in the same flesh in which he suffered, revealing the glory of the Father. Agreeing with these statements, St. Paul, speaking to the Romans, declares, Much more are they who receive abundance of grace and righteousness for eternal life shall reign by one Jesus Christ. His incarnation into true human flesh and his resurrection in the body from in that flesh is the foundation of our own salvation. This is why it's so all-important. Christ came to gather our human nature to Himself and to unite it with His divine nature and to present it to the Father. As Adam was meant to be presented, the first Adam, complete and holy and godlike, to God the Father, the height of all creation, mingled with the nature and the mingled with the energies of God, totally holy. And by this holiness, all of creation would be permeated since man holds in himself all of the seeds of the material world and universe. Within him, we are the height of creation. That's the reason that when man fell, all of creation was burdened with death with mortality, not with sin, but with mortality. Now man it is with free will who can participate in sin, unfortunately, 
and bring creation around us even into more destruction. We at this mission are especially indebted to Saint Irenaeus. This holy bishop went as a missionary from Smyrna, one of the churches mentioned in the book of Revelation. He was ordained as a bishop to go to fill the place of a bishop that had been just martyred, Plothinus, in the city of Lugdunum, the Roman name for the city we now call Lyon, France. It was in the territory of Gaul. This bishop wrote books to his fellow Christians in the Roman church. There were many heretics, many of those who pretended to be Christian, and yet seduced followers of Christ into their own pagan mythologies. In the Acts of the Apostles chapter 8, Simon the Magician was baptized in this chapter. We read it along with many other Christians and he expressed a desire to have the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Why did he do this? He saw that when the Apostles Peter and John laid hands on the believers, they received the Holy Spirit. They received the gifts of prophecy, speaking in tongues, even as we can today, by the way, uh, through the wonderful ministry of Jesus Christ as we repent and ask Him for the Holy Spirit. But when Simon the Magician saw these wonderful gifts of healing, prophecy, tongues. He wanted to have that power. But what did he do? He wanted to buy it. And St. Peter rebuked him severely and said, you had better repent. There is a gall of bitterness in you. In other words, jealousy and wanting to have these things that are gifts of God, but not wanting to pray for them and to seek them in humility by following Christ. So St. Peter rebukes him. And St. Irenaeus, our writer here in Lyon, France, when he's writing to the Roman Christians, says, many of the followers of Simon the Magician are in your church in Rome. They stand up and say the creed, like any Christian does, but they don't believe it. When they say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, they mean another God. When they talk about the creator of the universe, they mean a lesser God. Because in their heresy, in the pagan myth that Simon concocted to mix with Christianity and the terminology of Christianity, the world was evil. And so there couldn't be a good God creating an evil world. This is how they got around it. There were two gods. One is a lesser god and creating the evil things, material universe, and the other a good god who only created spiritual things, the angels, the spirit of man. And there was a giant war of equal forces between the two. Of course, this is all nonsense. And, but it entrapped many Christians who knew mythology as their version of science in those days. And that is why we have new churches that are the same heresy, that deny the resurrection of the body and the goodness of the creation and material universe. Their churches are called science, science of mind, religious science. And we have a major Gnostic heresy in this same tradition called Word of Faith that has virtually taken over the charismatic community. This is where the Lord gave us sovereignly the name of Irenaeus. We went back to Irenaeus's book that he wrote exposing the first heretics in the Roman Church that believed these things. And the Lord had us use His writings to expose the heretics now. 
those who make money off of the gospel of Jesus Christ, those who blaspheme the name of Jesus Christ by making him a born-again man. We had these things going on. And blessed Irenaeus was the gift of God to us as a mission to expose the present-day departures from this holy gospel handed down to us from the apostles. I want you to hear from this blessed bishop who is alive as he was in 180 AD. I want you to hear his words and I want you to realize that this is not the Western Augustinian Papal Church. It has nothing to do with it in spite of the fact that the papacy always claims to be the early church. How do we know it's not? Because the church that Irenaeus describes is the Orthodox Church. It is not the Papal Church. You can tell by the way he describes the bishops, by the way he describes the mysteries of the faith, by the way he describes the whole living out of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the whole communication of the churches between one another. This is what he writes about, the purity of the faith from the Apostle John through his teacher, St. Polycarp of Smyrna, and now in himself is made clear to us. This is why the gospel of St. John is so very important. You will recognize the Gospel of John and the understanding of the Apostles in the writings of this holy bishop who would later be martyred for the faith. While I'm reading his writings, I will show you the present-day Cathedral of St. John the Theologian that is in Lyon, France, even today. Remember this background now. It will help you understand the writings of this holy bishop and his love for Christ to the point of martyrdom and to the point of being very strong against those who would dare to pervert the teachings of the Holy Gospel and lead his precious lambs astray into eternal darkness instead of the light of Christ. May it never be for us today. And we pray that St. Irenaeus will intercede and pray for us even as we're reading his writings for you today. There is but one author, says St. Irenaeus, and one end to both covenants, old and new. All things are from one and the same substance, one and the same God. As also the Lord says to the disciples, Therefore every scribe instructed about the kingdom of heaven is like a man which brings forth out of his treasure things old and new. Matthew 13, 52. He did not teach that he who brought forth the old covenant was one person and he who brought forth the new another God, but that they were both and the same. For the Lord is the good man of the house who rules the entire house of his father and who delivers a law suited both for those who are slaves and yet undisciplined, and gives fitting precepts to those who are free and those who have been justified by faith. And he called his disciples scribes and teachers in this quote of the kingdom of heaven, of whom he also elsewhere says to the Jews, Behold, I send you wise men and scribes and teachers, and some of them you shall kill and persecute from city to city. Now he means by those things which are brought forth from the treasure, the new and the old, the two covenants, the old which gave the law which took place formerly, and he points out the new, the manner of life required by the gospel, of which David says, Sing unto the Lord a new song. And Isaiah says, Sing unto the Lord a new hymn. His beginning, his name is glorified from the height of the earth. They declare his power in the islands. That means continents. And Jeremiah says, Behold, I will make a new covenant, 
not as I made with your fathers in Mount Horeb. But one and the same householder produced both covenants, the word of God, our Lord Jesus Christ, who spoke with both Abraham and Moses, who has now restored us anew to freedom and has multiplied that grace by the Holy Spirit from himself. For one and the same Lord, who is greater than the temple, greater than Solomon, greater than Jonah and all the prophets, confers gifts upon men, that is his own presence in the Holy Spirit, and the resurrection from the dead. But he does not change God nor proclaim another father, but that very same one who always had more to measure out to those of his household. And as our love increases toward God, he bestows more and greater gifts. As the Lord said to his disciples, you shall see greater things than these. And St. Paul declares not that I have already attained or that I am justified or been made perfect, for we only know in part and prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, the things which are in part shall be done away with. 1 Corinthians 4.4 4. And Philippians 3.12 The new covenant, having been known and preached by the prophets, beforehand, Christ, who was to carry it out according to the good pleasure of the Father, was also preached at that time, having been revealed to men as God pleased, that we might always make progress through believing in Him and by means of successive covenants, and we should gradually thereby attain to perfect salvation, for there is one salvation and one God. But the precepts which form man are numerous, and the steps which lead man to God are many. Wherefore John does appropriately relate, the Lord said to the Jews, You search the scriptures in which you think you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures which testify of me, and ye are not willing to come unto me, that ye may have life. John 5, 39 and 40. How therefore did the scriptures testify of him? unless they were from one and the same Father, instructing men beforehand about the coming of His Son, foretelling our salvation brought by Him. For if you had believed Moses, said John, you would also have believed me, for he wrote about me. John 5.46 No doubt he said this because the Son of God is implanted everywhere throughout his writings, at one time indeed speaking with Abraham, when about to eat with him, at another time with Noah, giving to him the dimensions of the ark he was to build, at another time inquiring, Where are you, Adam? At another time bringing judgment upon the Sodomites, and again when he becomes visible, directs Jacob on his journey and speaks with Moses from the bush. All of these are given to show that the Son of God is the one who speaks to man in the Old Testament and in the New. Again, St. Irenaeus is clear about the meaning of the Eucharist, and he writes, from all the Old Testament, it is evident that God did not seek sacrifices and holocausts from them, but faith, obedience, and righteousness in order that they be saved. In Hosea the prophet, he said, I desire mercy rather than sacrifice and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Our Lord exhorted them in the same way when he said, If you had known what I meant, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. That was when Christ was speaking in Matthew 12, 7.
some of the various writings from the apostles themselves. But here is Irenaeus speaking about the importance of following the tradition of the holy apostles. And by doing this, we will not swerve away from the gospel of Christ. As you and I know, the scriptures can be interpreted many, many ways. That's why we have so many denominations today in American Christianity. But this is how important the Apostles' tradition is. We must follow it very carefully through the writings of men like Saint Irenaeus of Lyon, who was taught through his teacher from the Apostle John himself. He writes in Book 3 of his book Against Heresies, The Apostles did not begin to preach the Gospel nor to place anything in the Scripture on record until they were endowed with the gifts and power of the Holy Spirit. And they preached one God alone, maker of heaven and earth. We have learned only through the Apostles that the Gospel came down to us, which they proclaimed in public, and at a later period by the will of God they handed down to us in the Scriptures to be the ground and pillar of our faith. It is unlawful to assert they preached before they possessed the perfect knowledge of the Holy Spirit, as some do even venture to say, boasting themselves as being greater than the Apostles. For after the Lord rose from the dead, the Apostles were invested with power from on high when the Holy Spirit came down upon them, were filled from, with all of His gifts and had perfect knowledge. They departed to the ends of the earth, preaching the glad tidings of the good news sent from God to us, proclaiming the peace of heaven to men, who indeed all equally and individually possess the gospel of God. Here St. Irenaeus gives us the succession of the apostles and how they wrote the gospels. Listen to this. Matthew also issued a written gospel among the Hebrews in their own language. This is 180 AD. I just want to remind you, a hundred years after the Apostle John was writing. While Peter and Paul were preaching in Rome and laying the foundations of the church there, after their departure, Mark the disciple and interpreter Peter uh, also handed down to us in writing what had been preached by Peter. So now we know the Gospel of Mark is really the Gospel of Peter. Luke also, the companion of St. Paul, as we see in the book of Acts, right? Recorded in his book, the Gospel preached by Paul. Thy might is beyond compare. Thy glory is beyond comprehension. Thy mercy is immeasurable. And thy love for us is inexpressible. According to thy compassion, O Master, look down upon us and bestow upon us thy rich mercies and compassion. For Thou art our God, and unto Thee do we send up glory, to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever, unto ages of ages. Amen. In the Gospels, the Gospel of Matthew, the Holy Apostle Matthew, chapters 8 and 9, we have presented to us a number of episodes and events beginning with the cleansing of the leper, the healing of the centurion servant, the healing of the paralytic, Janine by the Pharisees, of Christ eating with tax collectors and unrighteous sinners, the questioning of why Christ's disciples do not fast, the discussion on putting a new patch onto old wineskins, 
the pouring of new wine into old wineskins, the healing of the woman with the issue of blood, the bringing to life the rich ruler's daughter, the restoring of sight to the blind men, and the deliverance of the mute and demon-possessed one. And we ask, what is being presented to us in all of these episodes? Is it a demonstration of the authority and power of Jesus Christ only? Or is there something more to this? Well, of course, it is a demonstration of the divine authority and power of Jesus Christ. But there is something deeper here for all of us to, to hear and to see. In all of these, we have been revealed to us the nature of our redemption. We see it so clearly in the episode of the Gadarenes, where they are delivered from bondage and set free. And in the healing of the paralytic, where the Lord forgives him his sins, then asks him to stand up and carry his bed to his house, revealing to us that that bed on which the paralytic lies, is lying, represents the sins of this world, and that in our fallen condition, we are in bondage to the sins of this world and cannot raise up by our own power from that bed. But when Christ comes and He forgives us our sins, He commands us to stand up and to lift that burden and carry it along this life giving us the power, the grace of the Holy Spirit to resist and struggle against the temptations of this world while we are in this world, but not of it. Also, showing us that our restoration, our reunion with our Creator God begins in Christ Himself, in His Incarnation, where He takes on human flesh. And this is why the early church struggled and resisted all and any heresy concerning the Christ person. There were many heresies that came about questioning whether Christ was all God, whether He was all man, whether He was born man and later became God. All of these heresies and critical to the teaching of the Incarnation is that He is both man fully God and fully man. And that in Him, in the person of Jesus Christ, is united the human will and nature with the divine will and nature. And without that, uni be that unity beginning with Christ, we don't have, we cannot have, a proper understanding of our redemption. It must begin with the person of Jesus Christ and it does begin with the person of Jesus Christ. Also being revealed to us is that the, the, our redemption is a process and it is a healing process. We have in the Pharisees always questioning Christ. Why does he eat with sinners and tax collectors? Why does he violate the Sabbath by healing? Why does he blaspheme when he forgives the sins 
of the paralytic, always questioning and confronting Christ. The reason being is the Pharisees believe themselves to be righteous. They believed that good behavior in accordance with the law, the letter of the law, equated to righteousness, and that all others, including the Gentiles, especially the Gentiles, were unrighteous sinners. And their Messiah was a conquering. They were looking as for their Messiah, a conquering general that would come to destroy the unrighteous and drive away all the sinners. But instead, here comes Jesus, this gentle, loving, kind physician who is healing and delivering, restoring humanity. He's raising, he's, he's raising the fallen human nature to stand upright and restoring the will to mankind so that they are now able to freely choose to follow Him or to reject Him. And this is for all of us. We all have that choice. Without His incarnation, without His becoming man, taking on human flesh, this would not be possible. But he, the Pharisees, had no regard or thought for the inner transformation of the heart. They rejected the notion of the healing grace of the Holy Spirit. We have as an example the woman with the issue of blood when she reaches out in all humility to touch the hem the garment of Christ to receive her healing. We see here an example of the inner transformation of the heart where she is the only one if you remember Christ is on his way to bring to life the daughter of the rich ruler and on his way he is, he, there is this crowd around him pressing upon him, many who are touching him physically. But there's only one who truly touches him, and that's the woman with the issue of blood. Remember, he says, who touched me? Let this be our example. When we go to church, for example, are we there out of obligation and duty? Or are we there like the woman with the issue of blood who truly reached out to touch Him? Let that be our prayer this day. The law was never intended to heal us. It was intended to expose our blindness and our darkness, our sinful condition. In the episode of the healing, of the restoring of sight to the blind men, we see here that the lamp, the law, is a lamp shining in our darkness, exposing our darkness, and that only the life and light of the Word can restore to us sight and light in our darkened condition. When the light and life comes to us, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Word, He restores our sight to us and lights up our path before us that leads us to Him. Glory to Jesus Christ, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
In 2005, the icon of the Theotokos, that is, in Sitka, Alaska's Cathedral, St. Michael's, toured the United States. During this time, the icon was realized to be a true treasure of our Christian faith. We see in the book of the Acts of the Apostles how things that were pertaining or touched by the Apostles and holy people of God filled with Christ's light somehow worked miracles. The Lord used these particular objects as well as the relics and clothing of the people to be a focus of our faith. The Sitka icon of the Mother of God located in the Cathedral of St. Michael the Archangel in Sitka, Alaska, is one of the most revered icons in North America. The icon was attributed to a famous painter painted in the style of the Kazansky Mother of God icon on canvas, an exceptionally beautiful and detailed riza of silver covers the actual icon of the Theotokos and the Christ Child. The Cathedral of Sitka received the icon as a gift after it was commissioned by the now sainted Innocent of Alaska, the famous missionary bishop from Irkutsk in Siberia. He was sent to, to give the Christian faith to the wonderful Alaskan Eskimo tribes. He translated uh, these scriptures and our service books into five different languages of the Fox and Inuit and Aleut peoples. His gospel of the indication of the way of the kingdom of heaven is one of the most pristine and beautiful and profound teachings on the gospel and salvation in Jesus Christ that we know of today. The last couple of pages here written by St. Inokenti. Those who neglect to take Holy Communion do not love Jesus Christ and will not receive the Holy Spirit. Consequently, will not enter the kingdom of heaven. So for the sake of your salvation, partake of communion as often as possible. The body and blood of our Christ is a true cure for many spiritual and bodily infirmities. In summary, these are the means of receiving the Holy Spirit. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ is the nourishment which sustains us on the path to the kingdom of heaven. Is it possible to complete a long, difficult journey without any food? The body and blood of our Christ is the holiness bestowed upon us by Jesus Christ himself for our sanctification. Therefore, do not be lazy in stepping up to the chalice of life, but approach it with faith and with great reverence and fear of God. In conclusion, without faith in Jesus Christ, no one can return to God and enter the kingdom of heaven. No one, even though he believe in Jesus Christ, can regard himself to be his disciple and share in his glory in heaven if he does not act the way the Lord Jesus Christ has commanded us to act. And no one is able to follow Jesus Christ if he does not receive help from the Holy Spirit. To use and receive the Holy Spirit, we must use the means granted to us by God. We should remember that the kingdom of heaven has the path that has been opened to us. We should remember that the path into the kingdom of heaven has been opened to us by Jesus Christ and is the only one. There is never and never will be another path that leads to salvation. Bishop Innocent stands out magnificently among all of our hierarchs for his remarkable qualities. Having grown up and worked to the age of 70 in the midst of nature, surrounded by simple children of nature, he himself was approachable, kind, welcoming, caring nothing for show or finery, nor prone to flaunt either his knowledge or his great accomplishments. His behavior at all times was simple and humble. His great natural intelligence was enriched with the wealth of knowledge that few possess. He gave a complete explanation of flora and fauna 
by the way, of the Alaskan wilderness that is still used by naturalists today. His heart had no place for envy or cunning, continues the person of his contemporary. Ambition, vanity, desire for riches or earthly comforts. He taught himself patience and industry, courage, perseverance, self-control, restraint, the ability to be content with little, and an implicit submission to the holy will of God in Christ in all circumstances. Preaching the gospel was St. Innocent's main task in life, accomplished at great personal sacrifice and hardship, but with great joy. He wrote to his bishop in Ikutsk about his missionary expedition in 1828 to the island of Unga. He writes, words cannot describe the zeal which with the Aleut people received my teaching and the gratitude with which they honored me for having instructed them, or the spiritual joy which teaching them brought me. Thanks be to God the Word for granting me His Word, for enlightening and comforting them with His Word. Bishop Inukenti opened schools, hospitals. He opened up a school of iconography, and he commissioned this wonderful Sitka, uh, which is known as the Sitka icon of the Incarnation, the Mother of God which is surely the most miracle-working icon we have here on the continent of North America. He was a master carpenter. He invented clocks that could work without anything but water and sand. He invented a peg calendar for the Eskimos to use in order to keep proper time of the feast days and the fast days. Surely this was a man that we would call a Renaissance man with many talents and yet gifted by God the Holy Spirit with a marvelous miracle working gift. His humility allowed him to be used by the Holy Spirit for healings and for deliverance from demonic oppression. The Russian Orthodox Church continued to have very difficult years during the, the time of the Patriarch called Tikhon. In 1917, the Bolsheviks took over the government and they summarily killed or imprisoned all of the bishops, along with Lenin. Stalin eventually killed 20 million Orthodox Christians, imprisoning many Jews, starving them and driving them out of the country also. Because of this, the bishops gave the American Church their independence from the Mother Church of Russia. Thus began in 1923 the Orthodox Church in America, which is one of the largest groups of bishops overseeing the Orthodox Christians here in America.